We must have some humility. We must approach Christian character with a humble spirit. But that's not all he said. It's another word that he used in his style. Uh, the word gentleness. Have you ever said anything in rage or anger without thinking it through? Let me tell you that sin. And it's important, I think, that we somehow curb that I believe that our church would be far better off if people said a lot less and did a lot better about loving each other. Patience. Now there's that other difficult term. The Bible says that tribulation produces patience. I would not advise you to ask God to give you patience. Amen. <laughs> because he'll put you in the cauldron. He'll take you through the fire. Patience comes because of great and great difficulty. But we can decide to be patient. We can commit ourselves to be patient. We can arrive at some form of patience because we choose to as the people of God. I believe that's important. Now that's just one verse, okay? We're not through with it. In verses 13 and 14, Paul suggests Christ's love rules or reigns. We bear with one another. We uphold one another. We value one another. And when we fail to do that, we create chaos. Bearing with one another. And then the big one, forgiving one another. Amen. We've already been reminded that forgiveness is so important. Christianity and religion uh, in that class. And this young man said, 
if God would come and sit right there in that chair and explain all this to me, I might believe. Does that sound just a little arrogant to you? Amen. God hasn't decided to tell us all the answers that we would like to know. He has told us enough to know Him and to know His Son. There are many things that I would like to know. There are many disciplines that I have not had time or opportunity or money to pursue. But those things don't affect me nearly as much as the things that I do know and I don't do very well minding. So he said, love rules. It causes us to bear with one another and forgive one another. And then he says in verse 14, put on love, which is the glue of unity. When we fail to really love each other, the word here is agape. It's the word for self-sacrificing love. It's the kind of love Jesus bore on the cross. I ran across another book. Let me just share something with you. Tom Blackaby, in his book, Experiencing God's Love in the Church, said this. He said often that when he's speaking in Canada and the United States and other, other nations of the world, has challenged people to look at the people sitting beside them. He said, look at that person sitting behind this side of you. Just, just look at that person for a moment. And then he asked the question, am I willing to die for that person? And then he says, if you are not, then you do not have the kind of love that Jesus has. Amen. Because see, Jesus died for us when we were still rebels. Amen. We were as rebellious as we could be. Jesus committed his love to us. Right? That's the kind of love that he really expects. Somehow, I have to confess that I fall short of that. Do you? And then he says in verse 15, Christ's peace guards us. Allow the peace of Christ to rule your hearts. God is in the position of taking control of our lives as we lack. And that he will rule in our hearts and keep us from making such bold, defiant blunders in our lives. His rule, His peace guards us. Allow Christ's peace, peace to rule your heart. You are called in one body, he said. On the 8th of March, I had the privilege of speaking from this platform, and I reminded us that Jesus is the head of His local church. Amen. Of which this is one. This is not the only one. This is not the exclusive one. This is one. And Jesus is the head. It is not a man. It is the Lord man. It is the God man. That he is the head of the church. It is important, necessary even, to recognize that all of us must relate to the head. And we can bigger and banner things around and say, because I don't get my way then I'm not part of the church or I'm blah, blah, blah. We can do whatever we want. Whatever we want to say. But the scripture says, are we not still a part of that body? And Paul is reminding us that we are a part of this body. Amen. Our challenge is to behave like it, isn't it?
you were called in one body, Christ's body, the church, the local church. S. E. Anderson, in his tremendous study of the church, concludes that almost without exception, the word church in the New Testament refers to a local assembly. And I believe he could go one step further and say in every circumstance, it is a local assembly. He makes the exception of a use or two in Ephesians and Colossians. But the term church is not used in scripture, in my opinion, at least in my study, as an overall uh, universal thing, as an understanding. Because the term itself is ecclesia, and the term ecclesia means an assembly. That we must be together <coughs> to be the church of the Lord Jesus in a location. And it's very important for, I believe, for us to recognize that that's true. Now, let's move on. Christ's word, verse 16, inspires us. Let the word live in you richly, abundantly, teaching and admonishing with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, Paul is saying, that the worship of the assembly is very important. That how we do it is very important. That if we're to affect the world around us and influence them toward God and toward Christ, we need to learn to behave ourselves orderly. And when we do not, when we are defiant, when we're protesting, when we're uh, upset, and when we're demanding our way and our rights and all of that, that's garbage. That's from the world. That's not from the Lord. Amen. So when, when those things occur, we have a serious problem with the Word. And you know the Word is Jesus, remember? That's right. That He is the message from God. That he is the full, complete message from God. Amen. I like what the writer of Hebrews wrote. I don't know, I don't know who wrote Hebrews. I kind of think Paul did. My opinion is that nobody else had sense enough to write it. <laughs> uh, but when, when he wrote that, he said, God in sundry times, in many uh, places, in, in various opportunities, in various ways, spoke in times past through the prophets. This morning we were studying Jeremiah, uh, one of the great prophets. That God spoke through these men over a vast period of time. But that he has spoken in the Son. The Son is the Word. The Son is Jesus. The Son is our Savior. Amen. And that God completed his speaking in Son. And unless somehow we have grappled with that and come to know it and, and believe it in our hearts, that we are on very dangerous ground. Christ's word inspired. Let the word live in you richly, abundantly, teaching and admonishing with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know one thing that I have been reading through the years? is that so many of our churches have moved away from the hymn singing. Right. Many of the hymns, now there's some that I would not recommend because I think there are theological problems in them. But many of our hymns were written by great Christian theologians Amen. who knew the Lord so intimately that they communicated it through music. And we lose something when that does not occur. Our youngest granddaughter, 13, I tell you what it is, has been in children's choir in their church for many years. And every month or so, they are introduced to a new hymn and they learn the hymns. And through the years of that training, that involvement, they have learned in school in the hymns of the gospel. I 
think it's a great thing. Amen. Paul said that you express this concern, teaching, and urging, warning people with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I'm thinking of, a, of an old song. We don't see it very much anymore. What will you do with Jesus? Remember that one? Amen. Been around forever. Almost. Uh, been around as long as my forever has been. What will you do with Jesus? And it, it says, you can't be neutral. Amen. You have to decide what you're going to do with Jesus. That's right. But the question comes to me as I think of Calvary. Is my master satisfied with me? Is he? Are we giving a good name for Jesus in the world? Are we so rambunctious and self-willed that when Jesus look at us and view our conduct, they say with Mahatma Gandhi, I could be a Christian except for Christians. And then finally, he says, we ought to sing with gratitude in our heart to God. When we clam up and don't sing, now some of us can't sing much anymore. Uh, I used to try to sing a little bit, and I irritated people, I'm sure, a lot. But uh, some of us just don't sing, and that's not a good thing because we're admonished to do so. Finally, this sermon has four points, not three and four, okay? <laughs> Christ's name, or by his authority, in Christ, makes a spiritual activity of even the most mundane and trivial things. When we are in Christ, there is no small job. When we are in Christ, our whole life is bound up in him. When we are in Christ, washing the dishes becomes a spiritual activity. When we are in Christ, not just prayer and singing and preaching and, uh, and going to church, but all the mundane things that involve our lives when we allow Jesus Christ to reign and rule in our lives becomes a spiritual activity. And so Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I could not think of a passage of scripture, a paragraph from the Word of God, that was more appropriate for our beloved church. I hope that we'll learn from it. Most of all, I hope that we will behave ourselves like Christians. And I hope that Jesus Christ will somehow culture us to get us ready for heaven. He can. Amen. And he wants to. And he will when we surrender to him. I do not know how to voice a invitation to you this morning, but I think that something needs to be said and some drawing the net needs to be done. But if God, by His Holy Spirit, has said something in your heart, and said, now is the time for you to take a stand for Christ and to trust Him and to commit your life totally and completely to Him. I want to invite you to come oh, just for a few moments. Maybe you would like to do something different and say,
simply in your heart, bow your heart, and confess your sin and your need of Christ in your own soul. We don't have decision cards in pews as many churches do. But it's possible for you to register a decision with someone if you choose. Right now, our church is troubled. Amen. But you may be led of God to become a part of an imperfect church. And if you would like to do that, we invite you to come and submit yourself or membership in White Avenue Baptist Church. One thing we hope to do is to, is to give God an opportunity to prevail in all the things that He wants to do. Would you come? Would you stand?